you know, progress for any minority group yeah. has to be constantly yeah. and vigilantly defended forever. That's just the nature of being a minority. I remember growing up and pretty much anything that came on television with black people in it was interesting to me because it was outside the norm for the most part. And so really for me, I think the turning point was the Jeffersons because here you had a sitcom where you had this upwardly mobile black family, mm -hmm. you know, moving on up, you know, and they, you know, my family wasn't nearly as affluent as the Jeffersons, but at least I could sort of, you know, as someone who aspired to college and who, whose mother went to college and mm -hmm. it was a middle class experience that you didn't typically see can you think of the first TV show performance that really, in some way, inspired you? When I was a kid, I saw West Side Story on TV. For, for me, being a Latina, you know, I was really, I was really inspired by the fact that I saw Rita Moreno mm -hmm. acting and, and having a um, you know, pretty prominent role in the movie. And so I really, I really enjoyed that because of the fact that, at that time, I wasn't really seeing any Latinos represented um, on TV shows or in you know most of the mainstream movies. So actually thinking about it though, I, I did notice that you know Natalie Wood was not Latina and I, I always thought <laughs> you did? Yeah, I always thought that was um, uh, something of interest. Uh, so so tell me about yourself. I mean can you think of experiences, Mine. television movie that were particularly profound to you? I grew up in the in the South mm. in a in a conservative Mormon home. Mm. Um, and military home as well, just to add that. And uh, we couldn't watch anything that was even PG rated, mm -hmm. like it needed okay. to be G rated. Uh, but at one point we got a uh, VCR, mm. and I had been haunting the video store for some time, and there was a, a movie in there I really wanted to rent. Um, and just FYI, like I knew I was a gay kid since I was six. Mm -hmm. Like that was clear. And because I was a southerner, I had words for it, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're hearing all the words, right, most of them right, right. pretty derogatory. So I knew what I was. I knew I should hide it and not let people know that it was going to be a problem. But there was this movie in the video store, and, and I got my mom's video rental card at one point. I snuck the VCR and the TV into my room, even though there was no one home, in case anyone walked in. I got to the video store and like, I must have been like 12 or 13 uh -huh. and I rented, because I thought it was porno, it had a cute boy on the cover and it was called 400 Blows. Yes. I know, and so <laughs> I, 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 popped the, I, I popped the tape in and I start watching what is Francois Truffaut's masterpiece, mm. French New Wave masterpiece, 400 Blows. Right. Yeah. And for the first time in my life, I saw a movie about a broken home with the kids struggling to survive uh, in that broken home. Mm. Uh, and that's what I was growing up in. Mm. And, and it, it, it was very real, it was very emotional and intimate right. and personal and, um, and had a very personal perspective. And I just sure. didn't know that people made films about people like me. And so I just remember halfway through it, I, I wasn't turned on at all, I was weeping. And, uh, and for me that was the moment I realized uh, I wanted to make movies. Well that's a great segue into sort of why all this stuff is important, right? I'm a sociologist, and one of the things I'm interested in is the impact that media have on society. Media tend to normalize things. The sure. more we see something in the media repeatedly over and over again, the more we begin to accept it as the norm. You know, and there are lots of ways to think about that. We become desensitized to violence if we see it all the time. It becomes normal in a way. Um, or you know, the society becomes very cynical when you know, all of its leaders lie, 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 and they're caught in, you know, all kinds of scandals. After a while, you know, the whole idea of truth, you know, people like, gee, yeah, I believe in that, that you happened. know, and, you know, gee, when does that ever happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> so those are things we know. And right. so if you, if you extrapolate those patterns to um, the absence, for example, of gay characters or mm -hmm. characters of color uh, or women in certain types of roles, <clears> I mean, <throat> after a while, people are sort of uh, socialized to see, um, sort of a TV view of the world. I see what you're saying. It's like, yeah, TV influences and normalizes, but at the same time, 
us working in TV, we're trying to reach out and look through the eyes of this very valuable young viewer and say, what does their world look like and how do we reflect that? Mm -hmm. Shows that look more like America, which is close to 40% minority, right. are the ones that have the highest ratings. Oh, yeah. That's what's key to, to our research, is that we're showing that, that we connect diversity to the bottom line. And right. so that we show that diversity sells. And, and we're, we're not just showing that diversity sells with minorities, but with, uh, it also sells with whites. If the industry really understood how significant this was, they would invest. Right. I'm talking about real change. When, when the industry says, look, um, the, the, the ground is shifting beneath our feet. You know, we're already at 40% minority. In another two decades, we're going to be majority minority. And people are already kind of flexing their muscles and saying, this is what we want to see. And I'm not talking around tinkering around the margins. I'm talking about fundamentally change the way you do business. Okay, so if we're talking about underrepresentation, um, where, and I'm curious, where do you find women are, are underrepresented in Hollywood? Yeah, they're severely underrepresented as directors, um, particularly film directors. But you know, in TV, you can see that as well. Um, and uh, you know, the the reason why is that Hollywood has a particular you know structure that um, has worked for it for years. But you know, it's been run by white males, and and that um, the decisions of who gets hired for what you know has come down from from is related to that. So you have white men who have traditionally done these things. They have the track record. They have the resume. Mm -hmm. So they're hireable in the eyes of, of people who are trying to patch together a project. And they make what they know how to make, for the most part, sure. you know, based on their experiences. And every once in a while, they venture into doing something that might be a little diverse or, you know, or non-traditional. Well, you have like a Norman Lear who right, understands. Right, right. But, but sometimes they, they get into trouble with that if they, didn't, if they don't diversify the writer's room or if they don't have you know, enough people who've actually experienced what they're trying to write about or trying, the story they're trying to tell as part of their creative team. Mm -hmm. It was very funny. At a certain point on this show, on When We Rise, I hired Tommy Shalami. Uh, he was, you know, gracious enough to come and do this project for nothing. And he was like, oh my gosh, I'm the diversity candidate because he's a straight white man. <laughs> you know, but we also, by the way, we needed a straight white man. Because we had those in the show, and right. I wanted to know how is this playing with mm -hmm. your experience. Right. So it's not like we're saying, yeah. like, get rid of all the straight white dudes, exactly. right. because that's another right. experience, right. and I needed exactly. to include that yeah, in exactly. as well. Yeah. Yeah. When people ask us, like, well, how is change going to happen, or, or where do you think change can take place? And a lot of it is, is just really diversifying those executives, like the executive yeah. ranks. And, you know, finding ways to to make sure that you are, you know, bringing up minorities, ethnic minorities, through, you know, the the like the corporate ladder, pretty much, of studios and networks. Okay, so Lance, we've been talking about all of the barriers and challenges and sort of contradictions in the industry that make it really hard to make progress on the diversity front. But then there's you. I mean, you're making these shows and you have these diverse stories you're trying to tell and you're bringing people in, into the cast and crew who are diverse. Right. I mean, how, how do you manage that? I mean, what, what best practices or lessons do you have for us that explain how you're able to get around the risk, really, of stepping outside the box and doing something that's not normal in Hollywood? You have to, you have to understand, as a, as a filmmaker, what's, what's most valuable. I think, at the end of the day, if you, make a, if you make a product that portrays diversity and it comes off as inauthentic, mm -hmm. you're screwed, mm -hmm. right? You're going to lose that potential diverse audience. Right. You're also, and it's. You may, you may antagonize I, them. I think. You say the wrong things, right? I think audiences are smart. I gotta say, I think they're smart. I think they have a gut sense of if that's authentic or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want my shows that do portray diversity uh, to, to make money, because this is a business. Yeah. And, you know, if Milk failed financially, I'm, 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 you know, hindering the ability to make LGBT films in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, I. Milk only got made because of Brokeback Mountain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Same, same st only studio that would pick it up. It's, they picked it up, I think, Focus, because they're like, we know how to make this profitable. I think faking it is riskier um, than the, the risk I would take with someone with um, a less dense resume. It does mean showrunners have to step up and fight for that with a network mm -hmm. who's yeah. risk adverse. When you were a staff writer, um, mm -hmm. did you experience any biases um, that the other staff writers um, like it displayed? I mean, I was on a show called Big Love, and uh, the showrunners were an openly gay couple. Even though the show is not, there's nothing gay 
really, about the show. Um, and so it was a pretty diverse staff. I think when you hire somebody who understands what it's like to have been a minority in some way, they tend to diversify a bit more. So uh, gender-wise, it was very diverse. Um, it was not diverse in a very unique way, which was it was a show about fundamentalist Mormons. It was a staff filled with uh, mostly Catholic and a few Jewish folks, and I was the only Mormon or ex-Mormon. <laughs> And so I found myself in the bizarre position of everyone making these assumptions about Mormons mm. uh, that just weren't true. And I ended up having to defend constantly the church that I had deep problems with. I ended up being its great defender in that writer's room, <laughs> uh, which, you know, I mean, by the way, it was a strange and comfortable position I found myself in as the defender of the Mormon religion. Um, uh, but I wanted it to be accurate. You know, it held the church to account, but to be accurate. But it was, you know, it was a, it was actually more of a good example of like by having someone who'd actually been a part of that, we were able to keep it slightly more on, on track. I think sometimes minorities in writers' room, and certainly I've heard stories from some of the women who were in that writers' room who told me about the previous experiences, yeah. was that it was quite alienating. Yep. I did not experience that in this yeah. writers' room. I, I was incredibly valued for my difference. Yeah. So, Anna Christina, do you see this whole movement toward diversity in Hollywood as like one step forward, two steps backwards, or are we on this trend now that can't be reversed because of where America is going demographically? What do you think the, the future holds? I think that if changes really aren't made and at the executive level, and I think that um, the industry is definitely going to suffer and something else might come in, you know, in its place. Progress for any minority group yeah. has to be constantly and vigilantly defended forever. That's just the nature yeah. of being a minority. Yeah. And it's what I tell young people when I go out lecturing, I'm like, you never get to rest. Yeah. It's never over, yeah. it's right. never done. If you want to feel more secure, you might want to start being a little less myopic about your minority mm -hmm. and join arms with a couple more and you yeah. might be a little exactly. stronger. Yeah. Um, but, but certainly, you know, history, uh, if you're a student of it, it's a pendulum and it's gonna swing back, and that's what we're in right now. Right. And it's, it's, Old it's- backlash moment. Absolutely, and it's gonna be work, and we're, this conversation we're having right now will never end. Sure. I think if this could be the beginning of something, boy, yeah. we could make progress in Hollywood. Yeah.